hit the atmosphere too shallow, and the vehicle skips off into space like a stone skipping over water. Hit the atmosphere too steep, and it burns up like a meteor. Friction from the air burns the heat shield, with temperatures reaching 3,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's heating up, heating up, heating up, and finally it gets to a portion of the atmosphere where the atmosphere actually acts to slow down that spacecraft. That's when the parachute deploys. It's also one of the riskier parts of the mission. You don't want that parachute to tear. And then what happens is the radar starts to see where we are relative to the ground. The rover and its descent stage detach from the parachute. The descent stage is called a sky crane. It takes over the landing and fires its engines. As it descends under its parachute, the rover takes pictures of the ground. Its onboard computer rapidly compares the images with pictures stored in its database. This computer lines up features it sees in the new photos with features it sees from the cataloged photos. If the rover is descending toward dangerous ground, it can change direction and move toward a safer place to land. It slows, hovers, and then lowers the rover on the edge of this tether. When contact is sensed with the ground, the tether is cut, that descent stage flies away, and the rover falls what should be no more than a meter to hit the surface, but gently. For a few minutes, the spacecraft will not be able to communicate with Earth. But we're gonna have that period where it will have happened on Mars. The rover will have landed or it will have crashed and we will not know until that signal gets back. There, those minutes of blackout are some of the most heart pounding moments as you wait to see what happened with the spacecraft. For the science and engineering team, comprised of hundreds of people, over a decade of work comes down to seven nail-biting minutes. A lot of things have to go right in a space mission uh, to get your spacecraft to Mars. One way or another, you're gonna be on the ground in seven minutes. All we can do is cross our fingers, hope for the best, and cheer on the crew that's making the launch happen. Perseverance is armed with a battery of seven instruments and 23 cameras that address questions about life in the past, in the present, and the future. And with two microphones on board, we will actually hear the first true sounds of Mars. For the first time, we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. We've never really heard our environment on, on Mars, and I think it's going to be exciting uh, to hear the entry, descent, and landing, the wheels turning on the surface of Mars. The rover will identify chemical elements in the Martian soil, as well as organics and minerals that may be signs of past microbial life. The latest in camera technology can capture features as small as a grain of salt. The Mars 2020 instruments are really well suited to, to look for things that we call biosignatures, uh, which are signs that ancient life might have been there in the past. If something ever lived here, Perseverance can find evidence of it. You can't prove it until you actually can get down and get your nose in the dirt. A drill shares the turret with the scientific instruments. The drill bores holes and extracts core samples. This is the system that allows us to take core samples of rocky material on the surface of Mars, carefully seal them in very sterile, clean vessels for eventual return to Earth. Once the sample is collected, Perseverance stores the sample in a revolving chamber located inside the rover. This chamber is called the sample cache, and it has storage for 47 empty tubes. Here, the samples are hermetically sealed. 
No contaminants from the rover will ever enter the tubes, and nothing can escape them. And in a mission first, these collection tubes will be the cleanest ever sent into space. To ensure whatever microbes come back are Martian and not from Earth. The last thing NASA scientists want to do is contaminate Mars. And at some point in the future, a site will be chosen where the sample cache will be deposited. This will become a depot. Perseverance will spend the rest of its mission bringing sample tubes to the depot. A future mission will collect the cache and bring the samples back to Earth. This makes Perseverance part one of a sample return mission. I think we have a lot to learn, life or no life, about the evolution of our solar system, about our planet, by looking in depth at rocks brought back from Mars. The array of cameras on Perseverance serve a multitude of purposes. The MassCam Z instrument consists of two fixed focus but zoomable cameras that are mounted on either side of the rover of mass so they let us get a stereo view of the landscape just just as our eyes do. The Mast Cam Z is used for long distance driving and infrared science. And the nav cams used for autonomous navigation. Temperatures are well within our limits, so we're ready to go. We're going to come up and do mass scan. The cameras work the same way as human eyes, giving us a stereoscopic view of the landscape. Mass Cam Z is effectively our eyes on Mars in terms of you know recon and assessing what the terrain is doing. The Mast Cam Z is used to choose targets for a closer look and to get a sense of the terrain surrounding the rover. What's special, though, about the mass cam cameras, in addition to imaging in visible light, they image out into the near-infrared wavelength ranges, and this near-infrared lets us get a compositional picture of uh, you know, when chemistry and mineralogy are changing in, in, in the rocks. The rover's extensive camera package are not the only eyes on the mission. Probably the most exciting experiment of all is Perseverance's companion, dubbed Ingenuity, the first ever Martian helicopter. Within 30 days of landing, the rover will deploy an experimental new craft. What we're then hoping to do is a series of flight tests. You know, first maybe just up and hover, then maybe up in a meter then maybe up and up to a couple tens of meters away. The helicopter has a camera, has two rotors, and we're hoping to prove out this new technology that we can fly the other spacecraft on Mars, collecting pictures from above. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotor power flight test in the actual environment of Mars. There are unusual challenges to powered flight on Mars. The air on Mars is indescribably thin, just 1% of the thickness of the atmosphere here on Earth. And Mars has a much lower gravity, just one third that of Earth's, meaning less lift is needed. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system is just spin very fast. You'll also see that the blades themselves are much longer and their configuration is different. And, and that's because to take advantage of the minimal amount of lift that's provided through Mars' atmosphere, you have to have a much larger blade size for any given payload than you do on Earth. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. 
Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. But there's one more challenge. With no human assistance and a lag in communication, Ingenuity will have to fly on its own, autonomously. Ingenuity is going to scout ahead of the rover, hopefully demonstrating powered flight on another planet, which would be awesome and cool and open up a whole new suite of reconnaissance.